Welcome to America's Cannabis Conversation. Heard every Saturday at 4.20 p.m. online at americascannabisconversation.com. Each week, we provide our listeners information, education, and insight into the exploding medical and adult use cannabis industry. You'll hear from industry experts, elected officials, local growers, detractors, and more. Learn how to build your own cannabis business, how to grow the product, what's legal, and where it's legal. Tune in each week to hear the latest industry news and updates from the American Cannabis Industry Association in Washington, tips on investing in cannabis, personal success stories, and more. It's time to join the conversation. And here's your host, Dan Perkins. This is Dan Perkins with your American Cannabis Conversation. Quick news. Los Angeles, California. People are skipping sleep aids in favor of marijuana, a research study reports. The study results show that the market share growth for sleep aids shrank with the entry of recreational cannabis dispensaries by more than 200% relative to the mean market share growth in a sample, and the strength of the association increased with each subsequent dispensary. The paper, published by the December edition of Complementary Therapies in Medicine, concludes In particular, cannabis appears to compete favorably to OTC sleep aids, especially those containing antihistamines, which constitute 87.4% of the market for OTC sleep aid. Washington, D.C. Senators demand update from DEA on marijuana growing applications. A group of senators are pressing top-level federal drug and health agencies to provide an update of status of efforts to increase the number of authorized marijuana manufacturers for research purposes. A letter from lawmakers led by Elizabeth Warren, Democrat of Massachusetts, and addressed to the heads of the Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and the Department of Health and Human Services, emphasizes the need to expand the supply of research-grade cannabis as more states opt to legalize the plant for medical or recreational uses. New York, New York, Major League Baseball officially removes marijuana from the banned substances list for baseball players. Major League Baseball and the Major League Baseball Players Union announced on Thursday that they have reached an agreement to remove marijuana from the list of banned substances and will begin to treat its consumption by players in the same way that alcohol use is handled. The agreement is the product of negotiations on the league drug policy, with both parties agreeing to the steps that must be taken to handle drug misuse through the treatment-focused model rather than by simply imposing penalties. Las Vegas, Nevada. A nonprofit marijuana group offers insurance to the 2,000-plus members. The National Cannabis Risk Management Association and Garnett Casualty Insurance Group announced a partnership that the group's claim will bring normalcy to the difficult situation for U.S. marijuana companies seeking insurance. The insurance is available to the 2,200 cannabis companies that belong to the NCRMA initially. The group will offer insurances that cover general liability, property and casualty, director and officers, cyber and auto. The group plans to refine and add to the insurance offered through the new program as soon as possible. And that's your American Cannabis Conversation. Quick news, I'm Dan Perkins. So who's joining the conversation today? Well, we're starting off with David Klein, the gentleman who created the cannabis-infused super jelly beans, and he's gonna talk about how to build a retail business. In addition, we'll have James Lee, what he saw years ago that enticed him to invest in cannabis, and what he thinks the prospects are going forward. In addition, we have Matt Anderson, who's with Vanguard Scientific, who's a CEO and founder of a company who has built a phenomenal extracting machine, which produces a high quality product. And finally, we'll have Stephanie Lake, a PhD student from the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia, and she's going to talk to us about how people are switching from opioids to cannabis for pain treatment. Fascinating interview. Also, this week and next week, 
we will have floor reports from the National Cannabis Convention in Las Vegas. And Chase Roberts of our staff at W420 Radio Network will be doing floor reports. This is Dan Perkins. Let's get going. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the conversation. We have a gentleman today who's been on the program before, but he's going to talk specifically about his new jelly bean product infused with CBD, and he's going to tell us about a new product that he's just announcing. So we're talking to David Klein, the developer of a CBD jelly bean that's a really different product. David, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. My pleasure. So let's start off right out of the shoot. How do people get a hold of you to find information about your new products? The best way is to go to our web page, which is Spectrum Confections with an S at the end, dot com, and you'll see that what we're doing, we're doing a 10 milligram miniature gourmet jelly bean in 38 flavors. It's fantastic. And we're also doing a tincture, which we call jelly bean juice. And our slogan is made with freshly squeezed jelly beans. And we have those in flavors like buttered popcorn, black licorice, root beer, all the really, really good jelly bean flavors. Oh, all of those flavors that I was interested in. So, so let me, let me say that uh, we want to talk to everybody can listen, but we especially want our dispensary operators who are listening because your product not only has all these wonderful flavors, but you also have a, a medicinal purpose of, of putting CBD in your jelly beans. Um, I'm curious, David, how did you decide it was going to be 10 micrograms of, of CBD in, per bean? How did you decide that? Uh, we talked to probably at least 40 different people in the industry. The consensus was do 10 milligrams. A couple people in the beginning said that do two or three, and that that way people could eat more and more of them. But everybody, it seemed to settle at 10. So you've created this new product, and, and the way you're, if I understand it correctly, David, the way you've structured your business, uh, this is my term, not necessarily your term, you're, you're not in the retail. You're not competing with the, with the dispensaries on a direct basis you're looking to supply dispensaries with your product and, and you have um, special packages where you have it in bulk and uh, then the dispensary can break it down into smaller packages. Did I get that right? 100% hundred correct. Okay. So you're offering a dispensary the ability to buy a product from you that's unique and different, a jelly bean infused with CBD and unlike the gummies, which can melt through heat, this travels extremely well, and yet it has the CBD that helps people. What's been the reaction to this new Jelly Bean product? Unreal. Unreal. So tell me what you mean when you say unreal. What we, in one week, we had 10,000 hits on our webpage. Wow. 10,000 hits. 10,000 hits. We were the subject of 1,214 articles in the trade, Cannabis Now, High Times. Every, every publication interviewed us. Why were they fascinated with you? What caused that? Is it the fact that it's jelly beans? Uh, we were the first one to come out with a CBD jelly bean. Did the people that interviewed you from these various organizations, did they have any idea that you were Mr. Jelly Bean, Jelly Belly? Yes, yes, they did. That might have been okay. a reason why they called. Okay, good. All right. So so a dis the dispensary buys the jelly beans, and is it considered an edible for inventory purposes, or is it something else? Uh, I would call it that, yes. Okay. So, um, uh, so you get ten thousand hits. You manufacture this in your own plant in, right. uh, in Florida. Correct. You are correct. And how how have the sales been going? On 
unbelievable. Another unbelievable. <laughs> I hope the first this one was, not, the first one was not unreal. This is unbelievable. So talk about how a how a dispensary operator buys from you. What 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 are the what's the typical package? How do they do it? They come eight hundred beans in a container. Is that one flavor? No, nope, there are thirty thirty eight assorted flavors in there. Okay. And we also beans. have a. 800 beans. We also have a 38 flavor sour, S O U R. Okay. And we have a sour flavor, sugar free. Do people like the sours? Uh, people that love sours will love these. Okay. All right. So you got the jelly beans. It's, you sell them in a package of 800. And uh, is, is it one package at a time, or is it a, a, a case? Or how, no, how, they, can buy, they can buy one at a time. One container at a time. Okay. And so then how do they typically price it? Do they break it down into what kind of packages? Most people are putting 10 in a package. And the average price retail is $20 for the 10 beans. Wow. Two bucks a piece. Yep. Okay. Um, are you getting orders from all over or are certain certain areas? Uh, we're getting all orders from everywhere. We shipped an order to uh, Asia. We shipped an order to uh, literally every state in this country. So, so David, we've, we've got about three four minutes left. Uh, I, again, I'm trying to come from the dispensary's point of view. So they buy 800, and, uh, and they put it in their packages, and it's flying out the door. Um, what's your capacity? I mean, are you at a, are you getting close to a point where it's getting harder and harder to keep up from demand already, or do you have a lot of spare capacity? We were at that point in the beginning. We added more equipment. We are now able to ship any order out within three days. Wow, terrific. How long does it take to make this jelly bean product? Uh, it takes about two and a half weeks from start to finish. Wow. It, it's, wow. Not done, no, it's not done the same day like a gummy bear is. It's got to go through various stages. So have you had anybody tell you how it's helped them? We have had so many people call. I cannot make any medical claims, obviously, but we've right. had people actually thank me personally on the phone for helping them with various issues. It's, I, as I said, I've used the gummies and it's, it's helped me. Uh, I, I'm a veteran and have a sleep disorder and it's helped me getting lots of, lots more REM sleep, which is healing sleep than I ever got in my life. David, I want to thank you for spending your time with us today. I hope our dispensary operators will have a look at you and go to your website. And why don't you tell us one more time how we can get in touch with you? It's very simple. Just go to Spectrum Confections with an S at the end dot com and a phone number is on there. Give us a call. I would love to talk to each and every one of you. So, David, what we're going to do is, is when, uh, we'll put your contact information on the website with the show so people can go to W420RadioNetwork.com and go to the archive show and they'll be able to see how they can get in touch with you too. If they didn't get a chance to write it all down. We, we've been having a, a fascinating conversation with David Klein about his new CBD jelly beans. And David, thank you for joining us today. And my pleasure indeed. Let's switch to the floor of the convention. Floor reports from the National Cannabis Convention in Las Vegas, and Chase Roberts of our staff at W420RadioNetwork.com. Hi, this is Chase Roberts, reporter with W420 Radio Network. I am here with Chris Walsh, CEO of Marijuana Business Daily. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. Fantastic conference. I just wanted to quickly ask you, you know, what was it like being one of the first industry reporters? Do you feel like... Things have changed, and it's now getting the proper coverage it deserves with the 
the help of you and your media. Yeah, it's really changed. Back when we first started, there was no one covering this from a business perspective. And now uh, you've seen it, uh, a lot of the mainstream media come in, take it seriously. They're avoiding hot puns in the headlines and in the uh, intros to their stories. And so they're taking it serious, and they see the potential of it now. So it's nice to have seen that iteration from what it used to be to what it is now. I totally agree. Um, and also, what do you think about the projection that this is going to be a $30 billion industry by 2023? Um, well, there's a lot of projections out there. We make our own as well. Um, you know, it's, it's all over the board, but when, when we look at the industry, we take into uh, account our institutional knowledge of covering this for nine years and um, filtering that into the estimates. So uh, whether it's $20 billion or $30 billion or $40 billion, uh, whatever that ends up being, which is hard to predict right now, it's going to be huge, and the growth uh, is just getting started in the long run, especially when you consider full legalization down the road as a possibility, and then the global landscape as well. So there's there's still a lot of opportunities out there and billions of dollars in growth ahead. And just quickly, what do you think is going to be the next big trend in the industry? Well, I mean, our focus is on the global landscape, so I think uh, as you look at it now, that is a trend that's playing out and will accelerate with other countries legalizing not only medical but recreational cannabis as we move towards that. And then, you know, hemp. I think that that being legal now is a is a massive uh, development that is positive. It's going to create a lot of business opportunities. That's where we're focused. It's hard to predict much more down the road than a year or two. So uh, the trend is going to be towards growth. There will be uh, some consolidation and, and challenges down the road. Uh, but uh, the future's bright. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for talking to me. Appreciate it. A report from Chase Roberts of W420 Radio Network. Welcome back to the conversation. And joining us today is a very special treat for me and hopefully for you. The gentleman's name is Jim Lee, and he is not only a professional investor in cannabis and other things, he's also a visionary, a, a futurist. And I've interviewed several futurists in my career, and they're always fascinating. So welcome to the conversation, Jim. Hey, great to be here. Thanks. Tell the audience who may not know what a futurist does. Sure, sure. So uh, people ask how I became a futurist, and just like anything else, I got a college degree for it. Uh, University of Houston offers a graduate degree in foresight. And uh, strategic foresight is really just about using what we know about the future to make better decisions today. And mm -hmm. what I do is I apply it to the investment process for my clients. So as I recall, you are a registered investment advisor uh, in a private practice. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I run a boutique investment advisory firm, uh, Strategic Foresight Investments. And our focus is uh, looking at opportunities and trends that haven't, hasn't hit the radar screen yet. So I'm going to be looking at technologies. I'm going to be looking at social trends. And I was investing in cannabis stocks before it seemed like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And as it turned out, that was a really good entry point for me. So if you, if you take us through the process of your futurist, when did you and how did you identify cannabis as a real investment opportunity for you and your clients? Yeah, so that would have been back in 2016. And uh, at the time, there were conversations about uh, legalization of medical marijuana. That was really the discussion before you know, they were looking at uh, legalizing it for medical use. And at the time, it was a really interesting, almost sketchy sector to do due diligence on because a lot of the American companies didn't have financial records. So I ended up doing a few of the Canadian stocks, which uh, at the time were the largest, you know, the best established, the most reputable, and had a good run on that. Um, you know, most of the money made for investors. Marijuana stocks was done back in the 2016-2017 time frame. Although with the recent sell-off, you know, I, I think we're looking at a better entry point for long-term investors than we've seen in, in quite a while. What makes you think that now is, a, is a, an interesting time to get in? Well, you know, if you take a look at the charts, um, 
you know, we're not even close to the top for marijuana stocks. I mean, we've had a, a 60% sell-off since last April. You know, that's going beyond correction territory and into sort of fire sale territory, as it were. Uh, you know, there was a lot of bubbleness, a lot of irrational exuberance going on in the uh, the marijuana stocks a few months ago. So I think some of that was probably deserved. But at this point, you know, it's it's a good time to do some due diligence, do some shopping around, get picky about what you might want to own in the sector. Just looking at some of the charts, it doesn't look like we have a, a positive price trend yet. But from a valuation perspective, I think if you look around, you can find some companies with reasonable financials that are reasonably priced. So it's it's a good time to start looking. Yeah. Some people think that the American market is rapidly gaining and probably surpassing the Canadian market. And so is the longer term opportunity in the U.S. or is it still in Canada? I think it's both, right? So if you looked at it two or three years ago, I would have said that um, institutional investors would have found better companies and better quality management almost exclusively in Canada. But I think that discussion has broadened somewhat to the point that you also have to include some American companies in the mix as well. So there's some discussion about the Canadians being in a supply difficulty of raw product, that the uh, the Canadian government hasn't gone as far as it needs to go to expand uh, the opportunity in Canada. How do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's that's one of the one of the issues that pot stocks have right now. Um, you know, one of the issues is oversupply. Um, in the supply chain, because while marijuana has become legalized in Canada and California and you know, Florida, um, the issue isn't on the growth end of it. It's not on the production of product. It's on the distribution of product. So you have states and you have provinces that, you know, quite frankly, have kind of dragged their their feet in terms of making distribution possible. Right. So. Mm -hmm. If you look at Canada, you know, the largest province in Canada at this point only has like, what, 24 dispensaries in Ontario. You compare that to Alberta, you have over 300. Same thing goes in California versus Colorado. Lots of dispensaries open in Colorado, relatively few in California. So you have a lot right. of underserved populations there. Yeah. Right. There, are, uh, I think I read recently there are as much as 40 counties in the state of California that have no dispensaries mm -hmm. at all. Uh, and, and yeah. I know that I live here in Florida. One of the complaints that actually led to a lawsuit is that the, st the state has controlled the cannabis licenses to the tune. I think there's only about five licenses that have been issued to the state and people are complaining um that sometimes they have to drive three hours to get to a dispensary and wait outside for hours. And then when they get in line to get inside, they have another waiting time. And so that the, the complaint, and there was a lawsuit that against the state saying that the, uh, the licensing procedure is too restrictive. And now they're talking about either double or tripling the licenses uh, in, in mm -hmm. Florida. And Florida was one of the fastest growing states as it was before all this happened. So there seems to be enormous amount of room for growth when you think about it just from market penetration. Absolutely. It's a supply chain issue, right? You know, people just can't sell the product at this point. One of the interesting sort of implications in terms of investing in marijuana is one, looking at vertically integrated companies that are not only growers, but they can also do their own distribution through ownership of their own dispensaries, which is helpful. The other thing that's kind of interesting is, is that if you can find a company or a group that has expertise in terms of compliance in checking the boxes to make governments and states happy, right, and more likely to give you permits, 
that's an example where having a strong legal team is actually a, a growth asset, right? It's, mm. it's going to help your business. Uh, we're speaking with Jim Lee, a visionary on the cannabis industry. Jim, how do people follow you or get in touch with you? My website is www.stratfi.com. You can also follow me on Twitter. I follow a number of emerging topics. Uh, my Twitter handle is at J-H-L-I-N-D-E. That's J-H-L-I-N-D-E. Um, James Lee in, in Delaware, basically, is how I came up with that. Okay. Getting back to our conversation, there is a, a supply issue. There seems to be a, an abundance of supply, which is affecting the wholesale price of cannabis, but it doesn't seem to be affecting the retail price uh, of products. Is that the distributors making more money than normal, or what's going on there? Yeah, prices are falling faster on the supply side than the retail side, so retail stores are going to be the beneficiaries of that. Absolutely. You know, we've seen 30% drop in price over the last year or two. So uh, it's a real issue. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I tend to favor the lower cost producers right now. The state of Florida requires a what they call a vertical integration, I meaning you have to grow it, package it, and distribute it through owner, dispensary ownership. Uh, yet there are some places in California, I have a gentleman who owns several dispensaries, and he told me that right now, uh, about 80% of the product that he sells in his dispensary is not manufactured or grown by him. They buy it on the wholesale market. And it's actually more profitable for them to distribute somebody else's product than to try and grow, build, package, and distribute their own product. Yeah, I, I can see that happen because there are some serious economies of scale involved with greenhouse farming, right? Now, the case that you mentioned about Florida, um, there are, are two stocks that I've been um, investing in personally and in for clients, and it's not necessarily a recommendation. It's just something for your listeners to look at. Um, one is True Leaf Cannabis, which uh, has a, a large position in Florida as a vertically uh, integrated grower and distributor of, of product. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've been sort of bucking the trend on the marijuana stocks over the last few months of seeing much better price momentum uh, for True Leaf stock than I am for anything else at this point. Uh, so that's been quite interesting, quite helpful. Uh, the other one that I've been buying is a Canadian grower called Afria, uh, which is one of just two or three medical marijuana stocks showing profitability and think reasonable valuations based on forward PE multiples. So um, in, in the right quantities, I, I think um, marijuana stocks may have a place in investor portfolios, but risk management and managing your position sizing is really key. Well, we've been speaking with Jim Lee, and uh, he's been talking to us about his vision on cannabis going forward. We thank you for joining us today. And once again, how can people get a hold of you, Jim? Best way to reach me is through my website, www.stratfi.com. Thank you for joining us. America's newest and fastest growing cannabis focused radio network, W420 Radio Network, is expanding across the country and looking to add to our sales and marketing teams. America's Cannabis Conversation, which airs each Saturday at 420, offers listeners insight and information on the exploding cannabis industry. It also gives advertisers the opportunity to reach hyper-targeted audiences, literally neighborhood by neighborhood. We are looking for motivated individuals who want to start their own businesses in markets like Boston, Las Vegas, Reno, Orlando, and more. To get more information on this opportunity or to apply, visit americascannabisconversation.com. Joining us today is a gentleman who's been on our show before, Matt Anderson, who has been a very successful entrepreneur and is now running a company that does extraction of oils and all kinds of things from cannabis and perhaps hemp. And his company is called Vanguard Scientific. Matt, thank you for joining us the conversation today. Hey, Dan, glad to be back on your show. Thank you. 
when when we had you on before, you were talking about how you had come from moonshine to this technology. I'm curious in this segment, I want to find out what you think is the business opportunity for your company and the opportunities in cannabis and hemp in general. Sure. So I won't go too deep on, on our opportunity because it's business to business and it's pretty, pretty dry. You can tell me if you want to learn more, but then I can talk more about the opportunity in the industry overall. Uh, Vanguard uh, Scientific, we're technology integrators. So we work with uh, the finest processing laboratory or research groups globally, uh, addressing the problem of compliant manufacturing of efficacious ingredients, small molecule drugs, or just oils and extracts that service the markets of tomorrow. So we're working with groups that are uh, speaking in the nutraceutical segments, the natural supplements, or, or the biopharmaceutics. And what we do, Dan, is, is simply identify uh, the equipment systems and solutions to meet those extraction, processing, or formulating needs of the client after understanding the market, the region, and the final product segment they're looking to operate in. Um, from, from, from our vantage point and from, from my background in regulated products and controlled substances, I'm just so excited at the fact that there's two conversations and narratives which are kind of de developing at the same time. On one side, you've got proven efficacious medicines, right? You've got small molecules like CBD, CBG, THCV, and then the range of terpenoids that are providing staggering and, and past anecdotal evidence, if not soon to be called proof, of uh, therapeutic and then some would even say curative properties. So there's this big revolution happening on the medicinal side and getting involved in that and the passion that has an opportunity to touch people's hearts, uh, both from the human supplement side, the pharmaceutical or drug side, and then also the pet supplement side is, is just really, really interesting. But then you cross over and you look at, you know, the, the cliched term, you know, pot uh, or, what, or what the cannabis segment represents in plant-based therapeutics or plant-based euphorics. Uh, and it's really, really interesting. If you look at the size of the alcohol industry, you know, I think it's something along the lines of $1.3 trillion, um, the global alcohol, spirits, beverage, wine, you put it all together. And you look at that, and that's a depressant, right? So that's, that's something we drink in a social setting in which we, we could become inebriated, uh, but it's actually a physical depressant to our blood and to our bodies, and, and I don't need to, to delve further into that. But then you look at cannabis, and you look at it as, as, a, as a host of different uh, plant-based substances that, that, that bridge the conversation of psychedelics, and you just call it a euphoric. Uh, and you start to think around the different times in which the consumer is going to spend luxury or available dollars recreating. And I think that there's just so much, you know, from the oil side specifically for, with us, that we look at and we get to say, wow, is, are they making a glass of wine, right? Or, or are they making a nutraceutical supplement? Uh, and, and there's just care and intention and, and strong commercialization happening in, in each segment right now. So I would, would it be fair to say, to describe you as your company, you provide the manufacturing equipment to a processor who is extracting oils or whatever from the raw biomass of either hemp or C, uh, uh, cannabis. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, it is. That, that, that's fair and accurate. We help on the facility design uh, and, and typically get involved with process and things are more soft goods as well, just as a function of how young the industry is. But yeah, Dan, you nailed it in a nutshell. So you don't really, man, you don't extract product to sell on your own. Is, is that also true? Yeah, so we've got a center of excellence in, in uh, Oregon, in the Willamette Valley. We process CBD uh, just for research. So you can come out and see a functioning processing facility. Our clients come out and learn and can train with us uh, using our systems and solutions inside of our client facility on live material. Uh, but no, we don't have any commercial or products nor participating in the retail side of the industry. Amazing, amazing. Um, Matt Anderson, our guest here from Vanguard Scientific, how do people follow you? Sure. Well, not too closely. Um, I won't be kidding. Um, <laughs> on, on Instagram, uh, at inspired people. 
uh, Twitter at Vanguard360, and then again on LinkedIn, uh, Vanguard Scientific. Where did you come up with the idea of inspired people? Yes, so in my first uh, venture in entrepreneurial endeavors, uh, it was a, a spirits company, a creative company, and then a community give back and outreach uh, organization. And uh, the first spirit or what we called expression we made was a, a Tuscan rosemary and Spanish lavender infused non-juniper gin, Dan. And, and that product came from my time in a, in a French kitchen, uh, in actually in Winter Park, Florida. And the, uh, the herbs in, in French cooking are called herbs de Provence are really heavy in rosemary and lavender. And as such, it was the inspiration. So the name of that product line is actually Inspiration. And from there, we moved into conscious community outreach, community-based marching, marketing. Uh, and it really kind of took a life of its own. So Inspired People uh, be- began growing as kind of a, a community initiative. Um, and it's something that's been with me for a while. Good. Um, I want to ask you a question, uh, not about your process, but what, what comes out of your process. One of the things that I had the biggest difficulty getting over, and I can't think of any other way to say it, but getting over, is how is it possible that CBD oil can treat so many different ailments with just basically one plant? So it's a great, it's a great, it's a great question or a great statement, and it, and it begs to ask or begs to present the kind of conversation that we were having last time I was on your show. And that's really these outlandish claims that are being made from a singular ingredient. I, I think that's part of the conversation. The other piece is, you know, inside of the cannabis plant, there's no short of 20,000 different types of terpenes. Terpenes are, are, are the, the essential building blocks of what you know as essential oils. Um, there's things called a cannabigerol, right? So there's a CBG product that's an analgesic. And there's small phytometabolites. I think it's like the statement that the space between the bars is where the music is formed. Uh, I think people are that are overlooking what we're really seeing here and the conversation we're really having around whole plant extracts, the entourage effect, or full spectrum medicines. Uh, it's a combination of the THC, uh, the cannabinoids, uh, CB, let's just say CBX, and these terpenes that I'm speaking of together that modulate and activate the endocannabinoid sensors inside of your body, both CBN and CB2 receptors, uh, to enable these, these plant-based medicines to, to actually heal. And that is one of the reasons why there are such a wide set of claims being brought to, to bear, is because patients or users are actually finding benefit uh, given their specific problems. When you manufacture your machine and you sell it to a, a, a processor, do any states regulate what that machine has to do, or is it Wild West? Again, it's a great question. Um, on, a, on a statewide level, there is certainly regulations, that on, is, and there's been a good amount of information sharing as regulation is rolled out. We only use and recommend passive or safe solvents, uh, we're, we do not recommend or, or utilize any hydrocarbon extractions during the process. Uh, but the systems that we manufacture are all built in ISO 9001 environments. Uh, the facilities we use are the same that build systems for companies like Bosch & Loam's Cataract Division and other medical device. Uh, while the industry isn't there today around safety, those business operators that are serious about that customer promise and keeping that customer – as competition increases, are. Uh, and, and quite frankly, uh, those are the primary customers that we deal with exclusively. We see stories of more and more companies that are laying off people, that uh, the vape industry problem hurt the vaping industry big time. Altria took a $4.5 billion write down of their investment in vape. Other organizations have not produced the kind of revenue expectations that people are looking for. Are we headed for um, a little bit of a slowdown and a, con- and a consolidation in this business? Or what do you think? Right. So there's a, no, there's a number of contributing factors if you're looking at it from, from the market standpoint. Uh, well, there's, there's no doubt that what Canada did uh, as, as a function of, of who, who they are as a, an industry um, has caused 
some would say a positive and some would say a very negative uh, initial sprint in, in the space. Lawyers and investors uh, be able to put together deals and build valuation on pre-revenue companies um, is the, the quintessence of a new industry, right? So in formational days of technology, um, there was forecasting, and that was it. Um, when revenues came in or quarterly requirements came in and were grossly below plan, uh, that began to obviously create investor concern. And it was very tough for the private markets to support those valuations. A perfect storm. And, and again, not trying to say that strategy firms are behind these initiatives, but to see tobacco uh, look for a write down uh, very close to embargo uh, timings and cost prohibitive uh, instances on the vape hardware themselves, uh, as well as a strong narrative tie to illicit cannabis oils, not discussing uh, a, a significantly higher fatality rate in an order of magnitude around nicotine exclusive vaping. Um, I think what you're seeing is the global industry, a, a industry with a capital I, uh, taking a serious look at the legalization of cannabis and making sure that the appropriate channels are going to be a part of and participate in that quote unquote toll that will be earned from this uh, commodity, but also very high-valued-based industry. We've been speaking with Matt Anderson, the CEO of Vanguard Scientific. Matthew, great interview. Thank you for your time, and I hope you come back and join us again in the future. Thank you, sir. Let's switch to the floor of the convention. Floor reports from the National Cannabis Convention in Las Vegas, and Chase Roberts of our staff at W420RadioNetwork.com. Hi, you are with Chase Roberts, reporter for W420 Radio Network. I am here at MJ BizCon in Vegas, and I am now going to interview Laura Morarity. And who are you with? I am the VP of Corporate Affairs at Leafly. So why don't you go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about your company. Yeah, so Leafly is the world's largest cannabis information resource. A hundred million people visit Leafly every year to find out more about the cannabis strains that they want to try, to read news about what's happening in the industry, and to find licensed legal dispensaries in the places that they live. So today, um, in addition to offering that amazing information that we've always provided, we're also announcing Leafly Market, which is a marketplace to help us sell to our customers some hemp-derived CBD products that we've taken the extra step of testing ourselves to make sure that they are free of pesticides, heavy metals, and have the potency they say they do. I was just going to ask that because I knew you were a resource, but I didn't, I, was, I didn't realize you actually had product now, too. So they've been thoroughly tested, and that's the benefit to the people that go to your website and are looking up research if they know it's safe. Who was doing the research, just out of curiosity? So we work with a group of leafy certified labs that our scientists internally have worked with to make sure that they're adhering to the highest standards in testing a product. And so we retest the products that want to be on Leafly Market to make sure that they are meeting the standards that we think are best um, for customers um, out in the marketplace. What do you feel like is the most important message you guys put out to people that come to your website? There's so many different sides to this industry. Are, is there a few, like, one or two things that you realize or keep reiterating or people really need to know more than other things? You know, I think for us at Leafly, the most important thing is that education is key to advancing the cannabis industry, and the more that we can learn about this amazing plant and what it can offer people, the more we're going to be able to reduce stigma to make sure people can buy cannabis safely and easily in the market and really make sure we can all enjoy the full benefits of the plant. Yes, and how long have you guys been around? So Leafly's been around for almost 10 years now, so we were an early resource for folks looking to understand cannabis strains. Uh, So we started out as a strain database, and today we have the world's largest database of strain names, and we make sure that we share with people um, user-generated reviews of how people are experiencing those strains, in addition to a lot of work we've done recently with our Leafly Cannabis Guide to help people start to understand how terpenes affect the overall experience of cannabis. 
Great. Um, could you let our listeners know the website to go to? Yeah, so if you want to learn more about cannabis, um, visit Leafly.com. And if you're really interested in trying out some new hemp-derived CBD products, please go to LeaflyMarket.com. You know what, Laura, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the conversation. Joining us today is a very intriguing woman who's pretty smart. She's working on her doctorate degree, Stephanie Lake. And I saw an article where she was published on a fascinating report of how people are changing away from opioids to using cannabis. So, Stephanie, welcome to the conversation. Thanks for having me. Tell our audience, Stephanie, a bit about yourself and your background and, and what you've been doing, and then we'll talk about your study. So I'm a Ph.D. student uh, at U- the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I've been studying substance use and addiction um, for uh, about seven years now. I did my master's uh, in public health studying substance use and addiction, and I moved on to uh, doing my doctorate in this area. And so I've been um, kind of interested in cannabis uh, by way of studying uh, in my master's degree, HIV and AIDS and other infectious disease epidemiology, and learning how uh, common cannabis use was uh, as kind of a self-management strategy of symptoms associated with HIV among people who use drugs who are living with HIV, and, uh, and also kind of seeing shifting trends in the use of cannabis uh, to manage pain, looking at how people are using opioids to manage pain and how that might relate to their use of cannabis. So all of this stuff has kind of um, interested me in my course of research, and so now here I am studying, um, focusing very specifically on the use of cannabis as a potential kind of um, harm reduction uh, strategy among people who are using other illicit drugs. So, Stephanie, the people that you studied, uh, cannabis became illegal in Canada, what, less than two years ago? Yeah, we just had our one-year anniversary of legalization uh, in October. But were, was it much like the United States where uh, states could pass their own legislation to make it legal in the state, even though that it was barred uh, nationally? Was there a similar, similar situation in the provinces? Did some of the provinces support it, or did this happen all at one time on a national basis? Um, so it is a, a very federal law that uh, prohibited cannabis from being legal before, and so we didn't have anything super similar to the U.S. where we were seeing provinces or our territories um, legalizing the sale of cannabis before, but what we did have was some municipalities kind of doing a de facto decriminalization of cannabis, so that's certainly what was happening in Vancouver uh, for quite some time, I would say about three or four years before legalization happened, we we had kind of a proliferation of storefront dispensaries that were uh, selling cannabis, and so they were selling um, products that weren't technically legal. However, the city, uh, to manage all of these kind of storefronts that it opened, they uh, moved to kind of regulate the the stores. And so even though the product that was being sold was not federally uh, regulated, it was still kind of... Um, uh, it was kind of allowed in the city, um, and, and the police were essentially kind of not touching it. So it was de facto decriminalized in certain places in Canada uh, before legalization, and that's certainly what we were seeing in Vancouver, where I study. Stephanie, we, we have seen many, many stories in the United States prior to the states individually taking on making it legal and setting up quality standards, testing standards, where the, the illegal market is, is full of dangerous, and I use the word strongly, dangerous cannabis. It can have, be contaminated with, with herbicides and poisons and mold, and, and there's no regulatory agency to oversee it because it's illegal. 
and its black market. Mm-hmm. You had uh, maybe perhaps in Vancouver you had a little more controlled market, but across the country you had a, a, a probably an active black market, and people had no idea what they were getting, and yet they they couldn't go to the government and complain about it because it was an illegal drug. So from a research standpoint, did the inconsistency of the product in the black market you think have an impact on your research? Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, that's been a long-running kind of um, challenge for a lot of cannabis research in Canada. Um, so we do, I should have mentioned before, we uh, before legalization, we did have an authorized medical cannabis system in Canada. So essentially that is where patients can get cannabis um, authorized by a physician for medical purposes, um, and then they would be buying that cannabis from a licensed producer of cannabis. So in that case, it is a regulated product. However, the number of Canadians who are actually able to access this system or find a physician that's willing to authorize cannabis for them is quite low. Uh, We have recent kind of national data that shows a lot of people are engaging in medical cannabis use, but they're not actually authorized patients. So so we did have a a version of regulation before, but it was not uh, for recreational purposes. So just before I get into the next bit, I thought I should clarify that. Um, No, that's fine. so consistency with product has always been a challenge, and definitely we, we do have um, a system, or before regulation, we did have a system where, you know, the products that people were buying tended to look very professional. I mean, they weren't technically regulated, but it, we do have a very sophisticated um, kind of gray, uh, so-called kind of gray market of cannabis producers uh, in in British Columbia, um, and so these products are quite sophisticated. I don't, I wouldn't go um, as far as to say that they're, inherently um, dangerous. It's hard to know. I mean, uh, I, guess beca- I guess because they're not regulated, there is a, a higher risk of certain things, um, uh, contamination and stuff like that. But I think a lot of these producers are actually quite, uh, you know, responsible and do want to keep their consumer base. But, um, but that being said, I mean, not having regulation makes it impossible to really know what's in the cannabis that you're taking. And so when we ask people what kind of cannabis they're taking for a variety of different conditions, they don't often have access to this information. And so, of course, that's a challenge for us. It's something that we hope to be able to um, collect better information on as we move into this kind of new era of legalization. However, the the patients that we, or the the participants in our study that we tend to follow, um, everyone in our study uh, is uh, using illicit drugs. They're very marginalized. They tend, um, they're very unstably housed. Many are homeless. They have low income. Um, Many are on social assistance. And so uh, access to the, the new legal market of cannabis is next to impossible for some of these folks. And so they will continue to obtain cannabis that is, um, easier to access financially uh, for them. So in this case, it will be hard to, to, um, to be able to collect uh, consistent or reliable information from all of our participants about the type of cannabis that they're using. So are you, just so I, I make sure I understand what you're saying, that <clears throat> the fact that Canada has made it legal nationally, the people who were buying before can afford cannot afford to buy the legal product is it because it's too expensive or why would they why would they be shut out there's a number of different reasons but yes i would say um the price is a, a big barrier so it is more expensive the new regulated um uh system the the products that are available in this system are are pricier than many of the products that were available before but also the way that it's sold so uh for example in the dispensaries some um on in the neighborhood of town where most of our participants either live or access uh services these dispensaries tended to offer kind of low cost um options for members of the community and so th- these types of options are not available now under the legal framework and so that is a challenge that is definitely facing our participants it's something that we're going to be monitoring as we move into the future of uh, cannabis legalization in Canada because of course um, when access is a problem for some of the most marginalized people who are trying to use cannabis for medical purposes that's that's a problem 
So it's something that, um, you know, legalization is, uh, I would say, definitely a good thing. We're moving in the right direction um, in terms of reversing a lot of the harms caused by the war on drugs. But when the mo some of the most marginalized people who were disproportionately affected by the war on drugs are not benefiting now for under the new legal system, that's something that uh, needs to be probably addressed. We're speaking with Stephanie Lake, a graduate student for her PhD, and she's written a report. Talk to us a little bit about the report. What, did, what were your findings, and were there any surprises? Sure. So um, this report that just came out a few weeks ago was a study that we conducted using data from uh, just over uh, 1,000 people who use illicit drugs in Vancouver. Um, it was uh, actually 1,152 people, so um, quite a large sample of people who use illicit drugs, all of whom were uh, reported uh, living with chronic pain. We followed them over a three-and-a-half-year period, and we looked at um, their patterns of cannabis use uh, as well as their patterns of illicit opioid use. And so when I say illicit opioids, what I'm talking about is uh, heroin and uh, pharmaceutical opioids that are... Um, obtained through kind of a non-medical uh, way, so either obtained through diversion on the street or it's a counterfeit pill, so it's not actually uh, the pharmaceutical version of, a, of an opioid. Um, so what we found was that people who reported using cannabis every day were actually about 50% less likely to be using illicit opioids every day. And um, we found this interesting, especially because when we looked at people who were using cannabis less, less frequently, so um, less than every day, those individuals did not see the same um, benefit in terms of the lower likelihood of opioid use. Um, and so this kind of led us to hypothesize there's something about engaging in this high-frequency use of cannabis that might be um, helping individuals better manage their pain, um, uh, perhaps uh, kind of better able to manage some withdrawal from opioids as well. Um, and we looked at a smaller sample of, of just over 400 individuals from the most recent follow-up uh, interview. Um, we asked them why they were using cannabis, and we looked at differences in reasons for use between uh, people who were using every day versus people who were using just occasionally, and we found that uh, people who were using cannabis every day tended to be reporting uses uh, that were more medical. So, for example, pain management was the, the most um, common medical reason for cannabis use among daily users. But we also saw that they were using quite frequently to manage, uh, to help with sleep and to treat nausea, which uh, kind of is consistent with the idea of, of using cannabis to help with sleep withdrawal from opioids. So this was a really interesting finding to us as well. It just kind of helped support the hypothesis that perhaps cannabis was helping individuals um, reduce their frequency of opioid use. So Stephanie, is this report available online anywhere? Yeah, it, we published it in a journal called PLOS Medicine, which is an open access journal. So this uh, nice thing about open access articles is that it's available uh, for everyone to read, so it's not behind a paywall. Um, and so even though it's a very kind of um, clinical sounding or academic -y paper, there's also a nice summary um, that has just kind of bullet points in more gen general terms at, right at the start of the article that gives a nice summary of what we did and what we found. Google Plus, P-L-O-S, Medicine, you, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Okay. And how do we get in touch with you? My email, which is uh, stephanie.lake at bccsu.ubc.ca. Uh, you can also hmm. go to the website for the BC Center on Substance Use, which is uh, bccsu.ca. Um, and I'm also on Twitter. Um, my handle is at s underscore L underscore Lake. Well, thank you so much for your time and the fascinating conversation about uh, what's going on in the cannabis industry for treating people, especially people impoverished. Thanks for having me. And if you missed part of this interview with Stephanie, you can go to W420RadioNetwork.com and you can listen to this show and all the other shows. America's Cannabis Conversation. 
thank you for taking part in America's Cannabis Conversation. To hear this show in its entirety or to hear any of our archive shows, log on to americascannabisconversation.com and tune in next Saturday at 4.20 p.m. for the next installment of America's Cannabis Conversation.